hunting monsters on and off duty. The Blue Line Bow Hunters podcast starts right now. All right, welcome to another edition of the Blue Line Bow Hunters podcast. Matt Steele here with you, Jared Bruno, and our <laughs> best guest we ever had. <laughs> Amazing guest, should need no introduction. Best sweater wearer since <laughs> Mr. Rogers <laughs> in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Uh, best trapper since Hugh Glass and Jim Bridger, because this guy trapped three raccoons in a night, and it earned him a trip to study tigers in Nepal. Yeah. True? Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. True. Um, uh, Kevin Costner danced with the wolves. This guy lived with them. <laughs> that's it. Also true, right? Yep. True. I tell no lies. Yep. True story. And been on the Joe Rogan podcast, been on with... Uh, Jay Cutler, the Meat Eater podcast, a good friend of ours, Bo Martonic. But he finally decided, like, listen, my career's starting to take off. I need to start taking this seriously. And he's joined our podcast. Yeah. That's right. That's by joined our podcast, he invited us up to Wisconsin to hunt turkeys with him. Here he is, Mr. Donnie Vincent. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, you very much for doing this. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I'm glad you guys came up. I, I, I mean, in a million years, I would, this is not something that. I love doing this. This is not something that I would do in a million years. I love taking people hunting. I love hunting with new people, but uh, I generally hunt alone or, you know, with my crew. But Correct, right. yeah. yeah. So how how this started out was we went on an elk hunt back in September, the Blue Line Bow Hunters. Check out that podcast. We did a two-part series on that. And uh, Lance shot a bull, and he carried it out like this with, like, the, the elk head behind him. And, That's right, yep. Uh, we called it the the... the I believe the Donnie Haynes. Donnie Haynes. Yeah. yeah carrying it out like that uh, post. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Donnie must have just uh, been bored one day or something, and he, he liked it. And I'm like, uh, I messaged on our, our post. I'm like, oh, my God, Donnie Vincent just liked our post. I think he just set his backpack down that was loaded with grizzly meat and yeah. just checked his phone to yeah. see where he was at. And yeah, and then he's just like, <laughs> that oh. That post who, just popped up, yeah. Who are these weirdos <laughs> carrying out a bull like this? But anyhow, yep. he, uh, he liked it, and uh, then I fanboyed over him. And I'm um, like, it'd be awesome if he ever joined the podcast. And he's like, well, hey, you know, I'd be I'd be happy to. But then uh, let's get it rolling. That was like seven months ago, and obviously your schedule is ridiculous. It's yeah. a little crazy, but I just, you know, you guys are police officers, and I have a police officer on staff, and just the work you guys do and the transparencies that have come from seeing what happens with police work in the last couple of years and and the ins and outs of. I mean, it's, it has to be one of the more complicated, more difficult, more dangerous jobs in, in the world, certainly in the United States. And just, I think, uh, police need to be recognized 10 times more than they are now. Uh, we, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. yeah. Man. Uh, uh, it kind of metamorphosized from me, like, talking to you on the phone, doing a podcast, like, doing it on the laptop to... ATA. ATA. Like, we were hoping to meet at ATA, and we're like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to just shoot my shot. Felt like I was back in college. Shoot my shot <laughs> and say, hey, I'm willing to come up there, drive up there, meet him at a hotel. And uh, you've been awesome, man, and uh, we appreciate it. We ended up coming up here, Jared and I, last two days and catching the last two days of your turkey season, and we yeah. had a blast. Unreal. Ab Listen, it's the same eastern bird, but I don't believe that. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's, no. It's that not. is a little bit different. Yeah. They may be the same color feather, but they are vastly different. Yeah. Yep. These they seem they seem to be different, yeah. Yep. They like to play. Yeah. I mean even um before I was turkey hunting, I think I told you guys I, I was a, a chairman for Ducks Unlimited group in, in Minnesota and a couple of the guys would come over here turkey hunting and, and I would just ask them about it, like, Hey, what's that all about? And they're like, Oh, we like to go to Wisconsin where the turkeys actually gobble. Mm -hmm. And this is just in contrast to Minnesota. And I've had some really good hunts in Minnesota, so I definitely know that the birds like to play there as well. But I think we've just always had maybe even more or more, maybe less turkey hunters or more turkeys. I don't know what the... Maybe a little cross. But they definitely, right. um, yeah, they make you feel like an all-star. Right, yeah. Oh, I feel like an all-star right now. So. Yeah. So we came out here on uh, Sunday uh, for, it was my seventh wedding anniversary. Thank you, honey, for letting me come <laughs> meet Donnie Vincent <laughs> and hunt turkeys with him. But uh, anyhow, we came out here Sunday. We hunted Memorial Day Monday. Uh, I shot a bird yesterday morning uh, at first light. Yeah, <laughs> 15 <laughs> minutes into the yeah. that day. Yeah. Uh, Donnie was upset it took so long for our, our turkey guy, TJ, to yeah. hammer one in. Uh, by that, I mean he came off the roost. 
Never happens back in PA. What a waste of time. Right? What a waste yeah, of time. No. That was the exact. It's not. A, it's not even five a.m. It was five a.m. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyhow, this bird uh, came off the roost and saw um, the Dave Smith decoy. Whitey. Whitey, uh, bright white head. And it happened to that bird because he came in with lovin a head. loving yeah. up on the air a little bit, yeah. and uh, yeah, the his head turned white, and it was exactly what we talked about. Before we even entered the woods that day, we're like, you got to see these things. This is a Dave Smith decoy. It's head. He's painted the heads white on these things because a hunter witnessed that, and it it happened yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Like it came in, and then boom, like a glowing neon yeah. sign. His head turned white right. coming in. And we're even even today, right? You see those two toms that we had in the picked cornfield. One was a strutter and is constantly strutting. That bird, and the other one never struts. His head was bright red. The strutter's head was white, white. the whole time. Yeah. Yep. So he's, I think, I don't want to say sexually active, but he's maybe the one that's actually Mature. going through copulation with the hens. Yeah. And this other Tom is maybe not doing it as much or not as interested. But, you know, this, the Tom with the white face is actually going through copulation. So when they see Whitey, I think they're kind of thinking like he's about to actually go through copulation with the hen that we have laying before him. So it just triggers and charges them that yeah you know, to come in and attack him yeah which then happened today but so i shot one yesterday we got on some more birds uh it was pretty sweet i was uh, elated um we had more birds coming in for jared to get a shot it didn't work out then after all of this jared made us feel horrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we get back to the uh, hotel and then when we went out to dinner last night jared tells us i've not I've never shot a long beard oh great well matt shot 15 <laughs> to 20 yeah, it'd be first. before they're like, who's going first? Who's pulling the trigger first today? I'm like, God, I lit it up to Matt. Matt, I'm like, Matt, you kind of set the trip up. I'm like, I'm not going to jump in there and be like, hey, I want to pull the trigger first. Yeah. You know, you that, could have. Just, I would have let you. Yeah, but or not let I was you. like, I would have encouraged you to take the first shot. I mean, your first long beard. But it all worked out as fate normally does. Yeah. We went out this morning and just had an awesome experience yeah. i'll let you take it over tell it take us through it I, the only thing i helped you with was your breathing i was like your lamaze instructor i don't know i think my pulse is still up from that shot because the adrenaline rush i think sent my spine through a reaction <laughs> that i don't even know what the <laughs> heck has happened it's still like inflamed but uh yeah it was it was a bit unreal because we were sitting there we made the post um you got set up there that morning put the decoys out letting things calm down and that you know, we're waiting for that first gobble. You yeah. Know? And then after we keyed in on, you know, they started hitting off around the area. We realized that some of the birds were teeing off behind us. And, uh, you know, TJ's making, you know, he's doing TJ. Yeah. He's going to work. Phenomenal yeah. caller. And very, very he's good very caller. He's very talented. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he's getting them, you know, triggered. And we hear him chiming in more and more to get a little bit closer. And then we realized TJ made a call and – they didn't respond. I'm like, he's coming. We're like, uh oh. He's coming. So like, they're on. They're busy. They're, right. Yeah. They're 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 bobbing head this yeah. way. So before I know it, Forrest is set up to my right, and I'm facing the field. Matt, you're to my left. Donnie and TJ are ever underneath the next bush. Donnie's being a bush. Yeah, he just disappeared with the ghillie Where's suit. Where's the ghillie yeah. suit? Yeah. Yeah. Sniper. But uh, uh, behind me, I hear there's a bird coming. There's a bird coming, and I'm like. Instantly. Oh, Forrest said that to you. Forrest, yeah. yes. Forrest oh, because he could see with the with, with the, the camera because he's angled yeah, at that okay. perfect angle yeah. up the tree line to where we're, we're ahead of him a little bit and we can't see that far to the left where he could see. So he's got the red camera set up over there, aiming up the tree line. He's like, "There's a bird coming," and that's all I hear out to my right of my ear. And I'm like, uh, instantly, I'm like, started to hyperventilate because I know <laughs> this is my opportunity now. Matt had his yesterday. There's nobody else there with a gun except this is me. On I'm you. like. I can't, I can't miss right now in front of like all these people. So this, all this is I going felt, through yeah. my head of like, this is my first time. Yeah, this ultimate this. turkey hunt here. And then uh, I was like, wh wh where's the bird at? You know what I mean? He's like, and then things just happen so fast. You know, I, I see through the tree line and he's like, you know, this bird's come. I see his head. Right. And then he's like, he, he like goes into like a, a, a half strut and he like does like the turns, you know, and then he's sprinting again and then he like stops and he does like a little snake and he's sprinting again i'm like holy crap he, and then he gets like 10 feet from the decoy he you know he squares up with him and he's like looking at him and then all of a sudden it's just like a freaking 
50 BMG boom, 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 like up against the Dave Smith and I'm like he's gonna rip his head off there and I could I, feel your heart pounding through oh, the tree that we were both leaning against. all I'm thinking about is like I have to have restraint because you know he has to get this footage you know what I mean because yeah. I was like let him beat him up let him beat him up I'm like I'm, I'm witnessing things that like I've only seen on TV at this point you know and I'm like this is unfolding right in front of me and you said that you saw my muscles lock up on yeah, the floor into the, so the gun I, I look over and I can see him just <laughs> tense like just i could just see you tense and i go <laughs> and i hear him go did you did you take uh, a breath yeah he, he said i did i don't know what the hell happened uh-huh. but so you when he came in all, all i remember is the, the red dot was on his neck the whole entire time and i'm waiting for him just to do his thing and then i wanted the fan to clear and i wanted his head to extend enough to where i get a clean shot and I, I swear to God, I didn't even touch that trigger, but that sucker went off. <laughs> <laughs> and like he said, it sent me back a little bit, like oh, unexpectedly, but yeah, it jolted you. But yeah, because yeah. you were probably just you know so focused, you weren't pulling the gun and no, were just in the pull. moment. Yeah. yeah, like not even thinking about a trigger. They're pull. so cool. Yeah, they they, they but, put on the colors and the mm. the display, the aggression. That I mean, yeah, your bird has huge spurs, bigger oh. than any spurs I've ever killed, and he's. I mean, imagine what that would feel like, him coming yeah. in and just pummeling you, and then, and then, uh, you know, they just, they just put on such a show, and then they're so tasty to eat, and they're, just, yep. yeah, it's, it's phenomenal, marvelous, yeah, phenomenal. I mean, and, and I always think about, uh, you know, like the uh, pilgrims, and I think about Native Americans, and I think about first feast, and then, you know, like All killing that. turkeys with uh, recurve bows and long bows and muskets, and it's just, it's so cool, and you look at all these old New England pictures, and yes. you'll see. They're harvesting the cornfields, right? They kind of do it as the Amish do, right? They have those stalks all twisted yep. up. And you see they have harvesting pumpkins and all their root vegetables and everything. And then you almost always see a white-tailed deer on a pole. Yep. And you see a couple of wild turkeys or a, or a, a goose or a few ducks hanging from yep. a, a tree. And, and you have like, that that's part of it. Infamous <laughs> shotgun with the swedged barrel. That's and right. Like, yeah. Yep. It's just, yep. yeah. Just incredible. So we've had an incredible time, man. Uh, it's it's just been beyond my wildest dreams That's to be so honest cool. with you yeah and just uh to be able to hang out with you um and uh i know i told you uh and, and i want to get into you know who you are and w- where you've come from because i know you weren't uh technically born in a hunting family where jared and i were both fortunate like you know our I grandfathers guess, hunting yeah. socialization like political socialization we grew up in a hunting family and i think it's so unique because for us it's just natural that we're hunters, you know, yeah. like we were born and raised in it. Like yeah. I go out b- behind my back door, you know, and there it is where you had to work for it. So I would argue that you maybe appreciate it more than we do. Possibly. I definitely am more aware or maybe not more aware, but I'm definitely hyper aware of the things that I've done and what I have. Cause I didn't, you know, a lot of people, um, mention how, uh, intensely ingrained they are in hunting, how focused they are in hunting, how hunting drives their entire life. Well, it was like that for me, but it was also mostly about the wildlife. It was mostly right. just about the animals. And then on top of it, I didn't even start hunting. Like people sometimes confuse me with having all of this experience and being a mountain man. And, and I've done quite a bit for who I am and where I'm at, but I didn't even really start hunting seriously until I got out of high school because I didn't have anyone to really mentor me or take me. or So I just... You know, I started duck hunting in high school, did, did a little bit of deer hunting. I was actually quite enthralled with um, squirrel hunting, and I know it's funny to think about that, but I used to wear a ghillie suit. I would paint my face with face paint, which I still have some on from this morning. I had a twenty two long rifle, and I would go out in the woods, and I would glass a woodlot from afar. I'd sit peacefully in the woods, and I'd watch what the squirrels would do. I'd watch them move. I'd watch the trees that they would key in on. I'd figure out which big oaks they were using, where, how they were moving through the woodlot. And then I would go and I would post up and I would um, snipe them. I essentially would wait for the squirrels to make a move. And then rather than run them down and blast them with a, a shotgun, I would just put it on their, their head or even behind their shoulder and just drop them, mm-hmm. work my bolt. And I would do that. And it was the biggest adventure in the world. And it was that taunting that I could achieve at that point and then after high school you know i immediately started going to alaska because that's how i was inspired with all the books that i have which i'll show you guys here in the basement of the cabin but um i i just was supremely present on what 
I was doing. And when I would go caribou hunting, it wasn't necessarily about shooting a big bull, although I wanted to do that. It was far more about seeing the caribou, seeing the tundra, seeing grizzly bears, seeing wolves, seeing what might look like a migration, the waterfowl that are flying south that time of year, the fish that are coming up the rivers to spawn that time of year. Just the whole I was there to wildlife. see the ecosystem. The, everything in general. That's right. Yes. Exactly. It, yep. it wasn't about a Boone and Crockett caribou. It wasn't about where can I shoot the biggest bull. It was about who can fly me in to the wildest place where I'm not going to see other hunters and um, how long can I stay and I just want to sleep in my tent. I want to um, have backpacking meals. I want to crawl into a down sleeping bag. Right. I want to hear nothing other than maybe a bush plane occasionally. I want to see the northern lights. I want to hear caribou's tendons and their hooves clicking on the rocks going up the river at night when I'm sleeping. And I want to feel the little uh, fear that you feel when you think of grizzlies in your camp or wolves howling. That's what I wanted. That's what I was chasing, and that's what I continue to chase. So that's kind of the presence that I have. So Whole experience. Yeah. yeah. What? I guess um, – where did that come from? So, like, I get that, like, you, you did this all on your own, but what inspired you? Like, was it reading the books? Was it watching something on TV? Was it It was a combination? Um, because was that's that's a lot to, like, all of a sudden be like, uh, I want to shoot squirrels out back to, like, I'm going to go out to Alaska and do this on my yeah. own. I mean, that's quite a jump mentally, I would think, yeah. to get mm -hmm. there. So what inspired you to do that? Um, it was a book that I have, and I'll show you guys this in the basement and, and – um, Maybe I'll bring it up for the next podcast, but it's it's a pretty good sized book from Jack O'Connor. He wrote it as part of an outdoor life series. It's called The Big Game Animals of North America. And for each species, I would read the natural history of the animal, which would kind of just go over the life cycle of the animal and where they live in, in generalities. He'd have a map and show uh, where in the country they occupy. And, um, and then each chapter had a painting on it. And so when you open up, I think the first animal is a doll sheep. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm positive of it. But you open up the first page, and the first page is this glossy picture, and you see these handsome doll rams um, on this on this shale cliff. And then, um, not always, but oftentimes, this gentleman who was painting these uh, chapter pages would put hunters in the pictures, which was I just think so cool. So way up on the hill, in little tiny, you can see what appears to be like a guy in blue jeans and a flannel shirt with a cowboy hat. And he's got his rifle, and you can just see him up there, and, like, he's looking at this big dull sheep. He's a couple hundred yards away. And then you read the story, and it kind of describes what's going on in the picture. And then throughout the chapters, he would have these little pencil sketches of actual hunts that he experienced. So it's how it played out. Yeah. yeah just... And it was just so inspiring to me. And he'd talk about, you know, the big adventure of, you know, getting on an airplane to fly someplace and then getting on a train and then getting on a boat and taking two weeks to travel to Alaska and then hunting in Alaska for 40 days, 50 days, whatever it was. And then, you know, taking two weeks to travel home and trading for flour and sugar and taking animals, you know, shooting animals uh, around camp for camp meat, things like that. And it was just, it was just incredible. Man. Just, it was just uh, inundating yourself yeah, in that experience. I, I wanted to be, and I didn't even, there wasn't, I never, to a fault, I never gave a career a thought. When right. I was a kid, like I just took each day as it came. I didn't have a plan. I wasn't a good student in high school until I started to kind of figure out um, what interests <laughs> you, like more so. Yeah, that's right, right. That's right. And then I got in some trouble in high school, and they basically made me. I got a long stint of in school suspension when I was in 11th grade. And then all I could do is my homework. And then <laughs> I realized how quickly I could get through my homework. You know, homework that took me all day and part of the next day and maybe even the third day, I was now done in three hours because I was in a room without pictures and I would just sit right. there and focus. So then I started to realize well, maybe I'm not, maybe I have more to offer than, than what I was originally thinking to myself, not to the world. And then I, and then I was like, well, maybe I should be thinking about college. And so then I started having this idea of what would I want to learn about and made a natural immigration towards wildlife biology and wildlife. Um, but really, I had no aspirations of a career or a job or I just wanted to be successful in whatever I did. And honestly, hunting and just being around the wildlife, whatever it took to do that, that's that's all I wanted to do. I never once thought about a career. or. But that occurred, honestly, at a young age for you. I mean, whether it was college or not, you realized that 
at a time where most people don't figure that out until they're 15 oh, years yeah. deep in people law enforcement undecided. career. Yeah, yeah. 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 and they they pick up a camera long. for the first time and they're like, <laughs> "Shit, I should have did this a long time ago." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's just so neat to me that you come from a non-hunting family and you start reading books, you know, um, and all of a sudden, like, it instills in you, like, this sense of adventure. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then it leads you to the going for wildlife biology. Yep. Uh, U of M, correct? Yep. University of Minnesota. And I had friends during that time. I had friends and family, friends that would sit me down and say, hey, uh, you know, we think you're hunting too much. <laughs> like just what's that our, mean our opinion yeah, right. we want you to buckle down and maybe um study a little bit more in college or just fixate and these are like these are peers of mine these aren't you know authority figures these are friends of mine friends, that are my yeah. age or slightly older and are saying hey like you know your grades are okay but you also spent three weeks in alaska this this fall semester and i just would right I'm like, yeah, man, like I can't, That's I it. can't not do it. Yep. I have this to go and me. see. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, but yeah, led to wildlife biology because I, I just wanted to be around wildlife. What right. is it? Uh, your words of, uh, in order to see great things, you must put yourself in fantastic yeah. places. Yeah. Fantastic things, fantastic places. places like you yeah, want yeah. to experience fantastic things. You better be in a fantastic, fantastic place, place or at the very least a fantastic state of mind. Right. We right. were. We were only in Wisconsin this morning. We were only in Wisconsin yesterday. We were in simple, rolling farmland country, but it was stunning. Yeah, you don't have to be in a, in Alaska. You can do this out your back door, basically, if you soak it all in. One hundred percent. Yeah, you can find the biggest adventure of your life in your own backyard. Right. Like, yeah. if I if I told you if you came to me and said, "Okay, Donnie, for the next five years." You can't leave the state of Wisconsin. You have to continue your film series. You have to continue filming, doing your projects. You can only do this within 20 miles of your home. I, I mean, I, I would still be fishing no for problem. giant yeah. fish. I'd I be think trout you'd fishing. Knock it out of the park. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, yeah. There's no question, right? There's yeah. no right. question. Yep, yeah. yep. I mean, with the way you discussed that, uh, when you read that book and you realized that the sketches and it was like an art form and the way he – that author, uh, you know, produced those images uh, it, through writing and his sketches. You know, you kind of took that upon yourself in y your career now because you're like a paintbrush with words. Oh, right. sure, I and great that. order. Yeah, exactly. If and it's you like you were in the movie 300, you would have been the dude with the eye patch that they sent back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, you're a warrior still, but yep. we're sending you back to tell the story. <laughs> yep, yep. We're going to stay and die. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, with everything that you have done with, uh, you know, Sick Mana and the film crew and the, your writings and the way you do things with, you know, your verbiage, it's just yeah. it's a, a combination I mean, of everything. And we just we talked about this last night. You may not realize that, like I may not realize, he may not realize what all he is worth or I am worth, you're, you're worth, but I'm telling you right now that what you're doing is amazing. Yeah. And it helps out so many people and it tries to mend the two sides of non-hunters and gives them the, the correct view of how we feel and see things you know, when we're out there and it's special, yeah. you know, I appreciate it. And that. I don't want to skip ahead too much, but like I told you last night, like the rivers divide, um, I believe, was that your second film? First, that, that was, was the your first, first, first film. Yeah. So, uh, your first film from the word go. And I know I've heard you say this before. You had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> yep. But like that first shot from the rafters, it's like, this isn't a normal hunting show. This is different. This is a cinematic experience. And I'm a whitetail hunter. Like we're whitetail hunters. And I was just completely enthralled with this. Blown away. I, yeah, I couldn't just... stop watching it. I'm like, this is amazing. And I'm, I get it more maybe because I'm a whitetail hunter, but like I also like just loved it. I got it. I was there with you hunting, Steve. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I was, I was like, I, well, you know, uh, if you haven't seen it, please buy the DVDs. They're awesome. But anyhow, <laughs> there's there's one moment in there where it doesn't go exactly the way you would want it to, yeah. Steve. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. I was sick to my stomach. I yeah. can't imagine how you felt. But, yeah. Um, I do want to go back. So you're at U of M, and I mean, obviously, like, uh, you know, you said you maybe weren't the greatest student, but yeah. you definitely had, uh, you know, you just have this air about you that, like, 
you know, that can do attitude. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of this podcast that, um, you know, Hugh Glass and Jim Bridger, some of the greatest, uh, what Jedediah Smith, yeah. greatest trappers of all time. I love, I, I heard a podcast with you where you talk about, you trapped like three raccoons in a night. No one had ever done that. Right. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and you trap these three raccoons and basically that earns you a trip to Nepal to study tigers. How does that work? Yeah, so it was just, um, you know, it was a funny little situation, but I would uh, finished off my college career at Douglas Lake Research uh, Center in, in uh, Michigan, and every year uh, the University of Michigan would radio call our raccoons and then do kind of a co-study with University of Minnesota. We'd triangulate the raccoons every night, all night, and, and during the day, and and uh, we'd build this data set, basically just teaching students how to catch an animal, how to put radio collars on them, how to collect data, and what to do with that data, and what, you know, just kind of teaching a techniques course, if you will. And then at the end, the because the University of Michigan would radio collar them, they would kind of challenge University of Minnesota to um, capture them and get the radio collars back. And, uh, and so me and a, a couple of buddies of mine, our professor, Dave Smith, said, you, you guys try first. Different Dave Smith. Different Dave Smith than the decoy <laughs> than the carver. Decoys. Yep. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and they said, uh, he said, you, you, you guys try first. And so we went out and triangulated these raccoons, which is pretty funny because sometimes we triangulate them and they're literally in a dumpster. And <laughs> right. <it's just> <laughs> where, where you would expect. Yeah, them. really funny because we're like, oh, Freddy is actually <laughs> in there eating pizza right now. Yeah, and, you that's know, funny. we're supposed to be doing this thing out in the woods. And so... We just triangulated them, came up with their with their points of where they were about. You know, it's not exacting. And then we took live traps and baited them with things. You know, we're using like old um, old fish, like you know, old old uh, paddock and and like different things that we think they're going to find attractive. And then we're trying to put these traps in the path of which we think they're going to go back to bed. And so, um, and then we went and checked the traps in the morning. I think we'd caught four or five, but okay. all three radio collared ones in oh, one okay, night. Oh, okay, gotcha. And so, um, went in to talk to Dave, and he's like, did you get any? And he always had his glasses. He put his glasses down on the end of his nose, <laughs> and he'd, he's, uh, the guy was always working. You can just tell a brilliant mind. He's always working. He's always looking at stuff like this. And then he, you walk in, he's like, how'd you do? <laughs> And I go, uh, how many do you want? He's like, uh, what do you mean? How, how'd you do? And I go, well, how many were, you know, radio callers? He's like, three. I go, yeah. He goes, what? I go, yeah. <laughs> and he said, did you get all three? And I said, yeah, we got all three. And um, he just, he swore. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, get all three. And uh, he was all, he was all amped up. And then that night we were having a big party is basically kind of like graduation there. And, and he's like, uh, I approached him and just said, hey, uh, I know you're leaving to go do tiger work. He's a famous tiger ecologist in uh, Nepal and Bangladesh. And I said, I would love to I would love to come along. And he's like, well, after after what you guys pulled off today, he's like, I'd love to have you. Yeah, you know? and man, so that's awesome. And went and did that. And Jeez. it was um, it was awesome. My parents tried to talk me out of it. They're like, yeah, I don't think this is a good opportunity for you. I don't think you need to go over there. Those countries this, are, you know. It's a little sketch. I get yeah. parents. Like, yeah. I, I get their worry. Yeah. Yeah, and, but, they, and, and I but just what an always, opportunity. Oh, yeah, and I was going to go no matter what. Like, <laughs> I didn't realize Bangladesh was uh, this gentleman's wife. Uh, his, her name is Francie Cuthbert. She's a world-famous ornithologist. Uh, but I was getting instructions from her because David already left. And, and uh, he was – he's essentially – if you're trying to picture this man, picture a wildlife biologist who is also Indiana Jones, a hundred percent. He was probably in his sixties at the time, but super strong, infallible, smart. Like he stared on the barrel of a, a guy with a machine gun and just navigate his way and negotiate his way through a country. He was just, he was, he was an incredible man and, and, or is an incredible man. And, and, uh, and I was talking to Francie and I said, what's Bangladesh like? And she was writing some stuff down for me, and she looked up kind of at me, and she goes, uh, well, no one goes there for any reason at all, <laughs> ever. Except <laughs> tigers. Yeah. And I thought, oh, okay. Perfect. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, when I was there, I saw it, and it was like, it's a rough place. But yeah. um, beautiful, really beautiful, amazing people, but uh, also, you know. Scary. Quite, yeah, quite a dangerous place. I yeah. mean, you were given specific instructions when you got there what to do, and had you not followed those instructions, we probably want to be sitting here talking to Donnie Vincent. Yeah, and I mean, and 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 we came, uh, I came so close to that uh, multiple different times over there, and and uh, yeah, it's just a dangerous place, and it's it's funny because it's 
the most dangerous around people, uh, it gets a little bit safer in the tiger infested and crocodile infested, <laughs> little shark bit infested jungle. Yeah. That's sad to say. Yeah. yeah right. Oh yeah. 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 It's Terrible a, around human beings because you're afraid of, you know, you get in the wrong cart or get with the wrong people. I mean, they'll, they'll kill you for your, your watch and the money in your pocket. hundred percent. And, and in Bangladesh, and like I said, the people are amazing, but, um, there's a certain uh, percentage of them like Americans, like anyone that are there to prey upon the uninitiated and the, the and those not, yeah, that's right. Yep. And those, those not paying attention and those as Naive. outsiders and, yeah. Yep. and, and yeah. And yeah, I, I, I could have gotten in some yep. R- yep. real hot water. How, uh, how was that experience? How long were you there? And, uh, uh how was it? It ended up being a couple of months and, um, it was incredible. I wish I could go now because, of just having a bit more of a perspective. Like back then it was just, yeah, yeah, I'm a college kid going on a trip. And just kind of like what we were talking about with uh, your young cameraman, like, yeah, he has such an incredible opportunity with you. And I think he does appreciate it and he does know it, but it's like you and I were talking, I'm 37. You said you're almost, you're going to be 49 here. Yeah. I'm going to be 49. And uh, it's like, man, you know, the old, you go back and tell yourself the rod story. Right. Uh, if I could go back in time, you yep. know, and uh, what I knew now, but um, yeah, you'd love to go back. And yeah, because it's just seeing the animals and seeing the people, and and um, and I brought a camera and I shot images, and and uh, and it was incredible. But um, yeah, it was just being a part of the country, like coming in and going through customs, and the uncertainty of going through customs in Bangladesh as compared to going through customs in even um, Thailand. Right, Thailand mm-hmm. is a little bit more of a measured country going through customs in Japan again like a little bit more a lot more calculated and uh predictable and as long as you're not doing anything wrong but in Bangladesh like they denied I'm in the country for five minutes they denied my passport because they thought it was a fake and I had to negotiate my way through that and then um I had to fly from um I flew from I think it was Atlanta to Tokyo Tokyo to Bangkok uh, Bangkok to uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, then Jashur, and like, you know, I'm flying in these airplanes. The the, uh, the baggage compartments are falling down. <laughs> the, I I can see the pilots when they're turning the airplane. It's just kind of, it just nothing is as though you would experience it in the states. Right. Airplanes turning really low. Um, one time we were on the air um, tarmac about to take off, and then all of a sudden here comes like five Mercedes Benz come zooming out on the tarmac and stop the airplane. And then they have to wheel a ladder out and a, someone gets on the airplane that had enough money to basically bribe their way onto the airplane. And, and, uh, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Probably no drug deal there, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yep. So no Memphis. Yeah. Uh, so after that experience, you come back, your wildlife biologist, where do you go from there? Um, the main body of the work that I did was in Alaska. I ended okay. up applying and getting a job with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, out of uh, the city of Kenai, but I would fly remotely out to the city of Bethel, and then from there I'd hop on a boat and go up to a series of rivers that uh, are tributaries to the Kuskokwim River Delta. And so studying um, salmon, the, basically the success of salmon uh, going back to their natal streams, whether that be Tool exact the Queeth lock uh, and a couple other systems to where uh, we're basically counting fish as they're as they're going up. We're speciating them, counting them, taking genetic samples, and and then aging them. So and how old were you when you at this at this point now? Um, early twenties. Early twenties. Er, early to mid twenties. Yeah. yeah. And what was the goal of like that research? So they want to figure out how successful the runs are going to be in these systems. So. You know, as far as like king salmon, right? Are the kings, are the numbers going up? Are the numbers going down? Are, because they would take uh, samples of some of these fish in the ocean and they would basically match those to samples of fish that we were taking up in this in the systems. And so they could correlate those two and say, you know, where are these fish in the ocean? Traveling, and are, right. are they being overfished commercially? Are they being overfished um, by native gill nets? Are they being overfished by sport fishery? You know, right. and they're trying to regulate this. Because the salmon season in Alaska, where I was, it would open and close by the day. Hmm. So you think how difficult it is to even know regulations of your regular yeah. hunting and fishing. I heard and, that before. Yeah. Like, it's crazy up yeah, there. Yeah, they'll close yeah. it in a day, and then it, get, it, it, it can get really um, tumultuous as well because there's a lot of money around. Right. And you have to know, as a fisherman, 
You have yes. to know when when they shut that door. Yes, and it might it's, even open. It might it might be open from noon to four. Right, right. Yeah. Really? It, yeah. That yeah, quickly. It's crazy. Yes. How do they get the word out? To like, hey, it's closed now. There's there's um, websites that you have to go to, and then yeah. so you're like know. scrolling while you're fly fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll report this yep. to the, uh, they'll report this stuff to the um, to the uh, um, board of fisheries, and they'll report this stuff to the different villages. When they, the closures are more around. They're not so much around sport fishing. They're around gillnet fishing. Okay. And so, like, that's really oh, what the get, closures yeah. are coming. And yeah. So that's, yeah. like, the big time fishing, like, yep. for the fish that we eat when we go out to restaurants. And yeah. Stuff. So yeah. it's, it's um you know, and I forget the numbers now, but a uh, fish that's caught um, in a commercial net and is going to market is worth, like, a 20th of the fish that's caught by a fly rod. Right. right. Because this fish is caught in a major vessel. It's just filleted canned or packaged and sent to a restaurant and purchased this fish was you know the guy bought an airline ticket he bought a bush ticket he rented a lodge he bought backpacking gear he rented a raft he flew out here he bought a fly rod he caught the fish took photos of it released the fish fish is twenty thousand dollars yeah so <laughs> yeah. so sport yeah. caught fish are worth vastly more than right. um commercial fish but obviously commercial fishery makes the world you know this is food right. this is fun yep. yeah yeah and um from that i mean uh back to the beginning i said that kevin costner danced with the wolves you lived among them this is a famous story i highly encourage everyone to just type in Donnie Vincent, go listen to your podcast with Joe Rogan. I thought that one was incredible. You did a great job on that. He's a great man. Yeah, and, uh, um, uh, you know, Jay Cutler's too. And just um, that you got you got to tell the wolf story for us. I mean, because it's just – I just picture – so like us, we get it, you know, and they're canines. But uh, I picture someone like in Miami or Los Angeles like listening to this that may be like thinking about hunting or – have an interest in it and listening to the story being like, what? Yeah. yeah. I did the Joe Rogan what, by the way. But anyhow. <laughs> when did that come into play, the yeah, wolf, the wolf story? When was that? Um, that was the second year. So I did that project three years, three or four years for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was the second year that I was out there. Second year. And, and you this is, there. sorry, but this was before you were hunt, like hunting that area, right? Oh, yeah. I never even hunted that area. I would just fly fish that area, spend time in that area, and then... Um, so you're seeing these things and these experiences that you're seeing up there, and this is kind of building that up. Fueling. Yes. Fueling, fueling, fueling the world. fire. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And this was, again, this was me working on fish and me being in the system. I was seeing wolves. I started to see wolves, um, and it's funny because I would fly fish, when I would stop working at night, I would go down and I would go fly fishing. And then in the morning or the next night when I would go down and go fly fishing again, my tracks would be covered with wolf and grizzly tracks, but I never saw any wolves or grizzlies. So I was like, I know you're here. Right. Clearly the grizzlies. Like I'm seeing tons of grizzly bear tracks on top of my tracks. So I know you're here. And I saw, and I'll never forget this, um, the Eskimos that I worked with, they're awesome people and they're really funny and they have – you know, Americans, as far as like lower 48ers or Anchorage people as well, they're very direct. And, you know, like if I ask you gentlemen a question, you're going to answer the question or say, I don't know. Or, and the, um, in my experience with the Yupix, they kind of like circle the story and then they kind of come in the back door and you get, you'll get bits and pieces of the story and then eventually they will get to what they want to say. But they're very, it's not that they're non committal, they just kind of take you for a ride, you know, and, hmm. And one of the guys that I worked with, uh, his name is Peter Gregory. He's awesome, awesome man. But I first met him, and I said, hey, man, I'm exhausted. Um, I'm going to go lay down on my tent. I just, before we start all of this work and everything, I just need, I've been going for the last, like, two weeks and getting out here. And this Sounds night. like this past Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> Sounds like this past <laughs> Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. And I said, I need to lay down. But I said, first of all, if you see anything cool, don't assume I'm sleeping. Come and get me. I want to see it, too. So I go lay down, and uh, within like 10 minutes, he's like, Donnie, there's a huge bear. <laughs> and I go, Peter, come on, already, huh? there's a, maybe the biggest bear I've ever seen. You know, and I was like. I can imagine this right now. Like this I was like, are you serious? And I said, are you messing with me because I'm the new guy? Yeah. He's like, no, come out here. So I go out there, and it was a massive brown bear walking through camp. A massive one of the biggest bears to this day that I've ever seen. And this area is not known for big bears, but he was walking by and the wind was blowing through his hair. And I was like, this is going to be an awesome 
time up here. This is going to be an awesome summer. And right. Then my backdrop was the Killbuck Mountain. So I have this huge mountain peaks all that's what i'm looking at i'm on the vast tundra and then i have the river um just to the west of me and you're taking it all in oh man it was just right here the water and it was the, incredible the you can air. hear the water and, yeah and at times you can hear the fish like if it was low enough water you could hear the fish like charging up the rapids yep. and um and then the wolves showed up and um and i could hear the wolves the first and i might get some of my facts wrong because it's been a long time but i could hear the wolves for one or two nights, I could hear them howling, and I would howl, howl at them. They would howl back, and which is not an uncommon occurrence right. when, in on my hunts. So I'd howl, they'd howl, and then I started on the side of the river that I was on. There was a big cut bank, and then, of course, on the big cut bank, then there's an inside bank on the other side, which is a low beach bank, which is where I was fly fishing from. And so I see one night I'm howling, and I can hear this howl is getting closer, and then I see this what I presumed was a female wolf because she was pretty diminutive. I saw this female wolf walking down the beach. And so I made a vocalization to her, not a howl, but I kind of was like, <laughs> and she sat down and she's just staring at me. And then she laid down and she's kind of like laying her head totally flat. And then I make like a, you know, a little, <laughs> she you know, she'd sit up and then she's kind of like tilting her head like a puppy and then she'd check it out and then she'd sit up and then she'd lay back down. And so she was totally engaged with what I was, the noises I was making. Right, right, yep, yep. She didn't really make any noise then, but um, I did that once, I believe. And then the next night I was fly fishing and then that's when I was, and I always, you know, people say like, you have that feeling that somebody's watching you. Well, when you're fly fishing <laughs> five feet from alders, Every, and, yeah, and every right. morning your tracks are covered with grizzly tracks. Right. You have that feeling a lot. I'd be fly fishing like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, so, hair, my and, hair would be standing yeah. up. And that's the thing, right? You're sitting there looking at these alders going, yeah, it's just like there are bear stories. Yeah. Somebody has to be in a bear story. Am I about to be in a bear story? Right. So, you know, right. I'm sitting there fly fishing on by myself. I'm fly fishing and like I'm just, but I feel this, this kind of thing and I'm looking behind me and I'm just looking at the sea of alders. And I might be able to find this photo for you guys, actually. And I'm just kind of looking at all these alders, and all of a sudden, my mind is like almost one of those paintings, a collage that you look at on a, on, a, on a wall, and then all of a sudden, you see a picture within a picture. Yep, yep. And that's what it was, and there she was. I could see her face, and she was staring at me through the alders, and I was like, oh, look at you. Yep. And if I faced her, <laughs> she would stop. She was just chilling out, but if I turned to fly fish, she would go to yeah, do, I'd start yeah. to see her kind of she'd come up and then I'd see her she'd kind of like try to steal a sniff, you know yep. just and You're um, curious, yep, and then she'd start coming behind me, and if I made eye contact with her, she'd snarl, yeah, basically, I think kind of saying like, I mean, I don't even want to assume, but I think she was basically saying like, hey, like uh, we're not buddies, I'm the boss, don't try to pet me, yeah. Like, when you make eye contact with me, I'm trying to intimidate you because I'm probably a little nervous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I peek over her, and she's looking at me, and I'd see her lip literally kind of raise up, and she would walk <laughs> directly behind me. And, uh, you know, I said this on a rogue, and I said, she's like three feet behind me. He's like, three feet, Donnie. That's one, two, three. Right. I go, well, maybe she was a foot and a half. But really, it was something like that, right? Like, she was... Or she could, like, reach up with her nose and smell your jacket, basically. Yeah, like, she'd be behind yeah. me, and she wouldn't, like, her nose would probably be a couple of feet from me, but she would try, you know, she wasn't trying. She was definitely getting sniffed. Yeah. But she would right. sniff me, right. and then she would disappear. Right. And yeah. then um, there's a few nights later, uh, so w the U.S. Fish and Wildlife really didn't want us walking on the tundra, so we had to do almost like these little Lincoln log bridges. Mm -hmm. So we'd cut up a dead log. We'd lay those down, and then we'd nail two two-by-fours on top of those things. We'd make planks. Walk it. Yeah. Because if we were to walk on that tundra for summers, end on end on end, every place we put our foot, Is those tracks would be there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Long, yeah, right, right. Because there's only a small growing season in the summer, yep. and you just can do a lot of impact. So yep. we'd walk on these planks, and then everything was really wet there because it's a really wet part of the tundra. And so we had these little decks that we would build out in front of our um, tents so that we could get up in the morning, put your pants on, get dressed, like, on the deck, and then you could walk to the research tent or the cook tent, whatever. And uh, and I woke up one night to what I think was the alpha male sitting on my 
platform howling. <laughs> and I sat up and I had um, a 12 gauge Marine issue Remington pump action. So I grabbed it and, and uh, we'd, our guns would always be field ready. So they'd be dry fired, safety off, dry fired, magazine full. So if you got startled or something jumped, you just had to pump it and Racking start pulling. Yep. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. No, nothing else. We call that cruiser ready. Yep. Cruiser ready. Yep. So I'd grab my gun, cruiser ready, yep. and I just sat up and I was like, Ch-ch-ch, and I put one in the chamber. And I was just sitting in dead silence, and I heard, like, his nails <laughs> on the wood. <laughs> I was like, what? And I was half out of it. I mean, half the time I woke up there, right? I'd sit up in my tent like, where am I? <laughs> I'm definitely in a tent, but I don't know where I'm at. Right. right. And, right. Um, and then I unzipped my tent. And I looked and I could see him. I was like, whoa. Like, <laughs> And then I'm sitting there and I feel like an idiot. I'm sitting there and I was like, oh. And I thought, what am I doing with this gun? Right. And I hit the receiver and I jacked it back and put it back in the magazine, hung or laid my gun back down. I was like, I'm not going to shoot a wolf because he's not going to attack me because wolves don't attack people for real. Pretty much, like right, there's only yeah. been a couple, right? And um, and another thing that's kind of weird is I didn't continue to watch him. I basically laid back down, went back to sleep. Like I peeked at him one more time, then I laid down, and um, and he moseyed off. But from that night forward, I would see those wolves every day, <laughs> and I would see the female the most. I would see the big male the least, and then what? I'm totally assuming this, but there's three other wolves that I would see with her. She, they wouldn't be with her, but they wouldn't be that far away. Right. And they looked like teenagers to me. Like, mm-hmm. they were full size, but they are always playing. They are right. always screwing around. And the big male was never screwing around, and the female was never screwing around. Right. And But those three were always screwing around. Like, they'd come into camp and, like, grab a Ziploc bag that had blown out of, like, the cook tent or something, and they'd play with it, and they'd chase each other around. And then Jeez. the coolest thing is that I would go on these big, long walks for exercise, and they would freaking go with me. And that was the, the two two parts were cool. That part, and I'd go for, I mean, I'd probably walk like seven or eight miles, and they would go with me the they whole way. They would go way. with you. <laughs> yeah, like I couldn't always see them. Like sometimes they'd disappear for 20, 30 minutes, and all of a sudden I'd see them ahead of me. Yeah. And then they'd disappear, and then all of a sudden I'd see them behind me or off to my side. And but they knew exactly where you were at at all times. All right? times, right. yeah. And yeah. I don't know why they were just going with me just to, like, check it out or whatever, but they were – it was always the young ones. It was always the young ones and um, maybe once or twice the female. But I think m- by and large it was the young ones. But they felt comfortable around. with you around. Yeah. Totally didn't even right. – most of the time didn't even make eye contact with me. Right. They would just act like I didn't even exist. But they probably felt the same from you though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you for felt comfortable like with them. Yeah. That alpha male, he was probably just letting you know like listen – I'm letting you live here, but I'm the boss. Yeah, I think he's probably saying, like, this is my territory, right? Like, I'm here to eat. I'm here to feed. Mm -hmm. Um, You're not here to feed, I think. So, you know, and I'm of course, I'm anthropomorphizing all this. But, yeah, Yeah, that's right. Well, you'll never know, but it's just neat to think. That's part of, like, even hunting. You're always trying to think, what was that animal thinking? Yeah. Where was he going? What was he doing? And and, um, and the one thing that I did try to do that was unethical. I did two things that were unethical. One – uh, the native guys that worked with me, they wanted to shoot those wolves bad. Mm-hmm. I think I talked about this on Rogan. but I Because they didn't feel safe around them. No, they wanted the money. Like, mm-hmm. they want the pelt. They want to, like, shoot right. it. And mm-hmm. they want it. And they, not even just the money. Like, just like we do. Like, they want to say, hey, I've, I killed a wolf. Killed you know, a wolf, like, yeah. And right. They, you know. Yeah. Um, but I was like, this is horrible to say no. But I'll admit it. But they, I was like, man, what if those wolves are your ancestors? And they're like, oh. That's, I said, how often do you guys see wolves? They said, never. I said, so, yet we're seeing wolves every day, and they're spending the the time with us. And I said, I would feel a lot better of you guys killing wolves if wolves were just passing through. Right, yeah. These wolves have obviously um, taken up living here. So, like, I think it would be not very neighborly of us to kill them. Right, yeah. Um, they're trusting of us. We're trusting of them. And I said, and have you never seen that, ever seen that before? And they said, no. And I said, well, Maybe there's a bigger meaning here. It's like bad juju if you do yeah. something like that. Yeah, you know, like it's you like don't, it's, you don't yeah. hunt in your front yard. I don't want right? to say it's like killing an yeah. albino deer, but it's there's, there's there's that. Yeah, there's an unwritten rule. Yeah, behind yeah. Yeah, it or so something. We, I don't know. It's so I wanted to keep the peace, and so they agreed. And um, and then the other thing is I tried to feed her 
the female and that's super unethical especially as a biologist but um <laughs> i would find she was carrying around these fish she grabbed these fish that were pretty rotten yeah and like so salmon like fish? salmon okay. yeah because what would happen is they'd go up and spawn and then they their bodies would float down half dead or nearly dead and they'd wash up on my research gear and so then i would you know i'd grab those fish and um and so some of them would be females that wouldn't spawn so they're they still have all the row in their tummy so i'm like she would really benefit from eating this fish filled with all of this roe. So as a biologist, you knew. <laughs> I get where you say why it, it's unethical because now you're impacting something. Yes. But at the same point in time, you know a little bit more about it than she does too. Yeah. And so I was, I was trying to, but I tried to hand it to her. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and she wouldn't take it. She wouldn't I was even say if you tossed it in the pile for her. And that's what ended up happening because okay. she wouldn't. She wouldn't even. I mean, about where your tripod is there. That's okay. about. If I was facing her, that's about as close as she would come. If I made eye contact with her or was turning and squaring up my shoulders to her, she'd come about that close to me. Okay. If I would not pay attention to her she come quite a bit closer to me because I think she thought she was getting away with something. So right. I ended up just tossing her the best fish that I could find and she'd take them. And, and, um, and I did other things too. Like there's, uh, there's a, a fish called a Dolly Varden. It's in the char family. They're beautiful. They almost look like a little gray, uh, trout. They have, they uh, you guys know what a brook trout is. Mm -hmm. They look like brook trout essentially, and they okay. can get quite yep. large, but I would, um, I'd take my pocket knife out and anytime a big hen, uh, female salmon are called hens. The the males are called bucks. Just huh. um, it's weird, but um, anytime I had a big hen, I would just slice her um, ovipositor open and her belly open, and then I would just put her under the water and I would just shake her by her her tail, and those eggs would just like glitter, the and the fish would. It got to where if I was kneeling in the river and I would just do this, like I'd have a dozen fish grayling and and um dolly varden like in my lap like flopping up into my waders it's like i crazy. could easily just grab any fish that i wanted because they were just it was a feeding frenzy and and um and i'd see them because I'd, I'd catch them like down around the the corner and their bellies would be just hard with salmon yeah. row, and it was just really cool to be you know what i'm living there too so i'm living there for four to five months over the summer and so it's different than when you visit a place or it's different as when you like go to a place for work and then you leave at the in the evening time and then you come back like this is my home and these wolves were living here and right yep, yep. i knew it wasn't this wasn't a, a mystical event where the wolves chose me this was easy fishing for them where i was and so they were there right. to catch fish and and um yep just take advantage of the whole situation take advantage. Yeah. but it was it was remarkable and right. it was, it, right. was, it, it was amazing this makes you feel that that much deeper in the connection with Right. Just your surroundings when something like that happens, you yeah. know what I mean? So it's just one of those. You said things. you were in your early twenties. Yeah. What an experience to have. Like <laughs> right. that's just crazy. So, uh, how long did you work for the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife? Um, I did that project for four or five years, I think. Three, four, um, three, four years. I did the project, and then I I came home and helped them with some other projects on the fifth year, um, and then after that, I basically kind of got out of it and I did one more project uh, for a friend of mine named Guthrie Zimmerman who was working, he was finishing his PhD on rough grouse in northern Minnesota and I did a, a research project with him, it was a drumming study there basically uh, the University of Minnesota owns I think it's like five square miles of territory, it might be more than that, I might be grossly underestimating that up in northern Minnesota where they were studying, they study a lot of things there, forestry, white-tailed deer rough grouse, uh, black bears but they wanted to correlate this drumming study that they had been learning on this um, habitat that they knew very, very well because they own it to what would happen in natural wild settings. So I went out into natural wild settings and I was basically the, um, you know, the, the measuring stick against what they, they wanted to see. Like <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this is data set a on, on the cool K piece data set B is what's happening in the, in the wildlands. And so I was, kind of the metric to, to bounce those ideas off of. So neat. And like during this time, like when you're in Alaska and then studying the rough grouse, were you still going on hunting trips then? Oh, yeah. 
still oh that never ended yeah so when i would finish my working to live then yes when i would finish <laughs> my, working to hunt my fish work i would fly the first thing i would do is i'd fly up to the arctic circle and hunt caribou okay and, yep. yeah that's that's way that's way to take advantage of something there that'd yeah. be great yep 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 absolutely so, so uh as you're doing this at what point do you make the transition from donnie vincent biologist mm-hmm. to start heading towards the donnie vincent that's hanging out here in uh looks like we're in alaska but we're in wisconsin yeah. at your cabin yeah <laughs> yeah uh but do you remember a time or a specific moment where you're like okay like i'm a biologist but this maybe isn't what i want to do or was there something that you did and then it spurred from that yeah to come towards this yep well i knew right away uh so a dear friend of mine uh frank harris was a biologist that i worked with and he was um, you know, <laughs> Frank back then I would have described as kind of like this derelict, but he's actually, an, he's, he's an amazing guy. Uh, he was really, really strong dude. He's really good in the wilderness. He's a great hunter. Um, and, but he's just kind of like, a, he's, he's a super macho guy and he was just always funny to be it's around. Good him. old boy. Yeah. Like yeah. if you did something stupid, he'd give you man points. Right. Yeah. And he'd always say that. Like if I was going to crash a boat and I increased my speed, he'd, he'd say, wait a minute, you knew we were going to crash. But like, yet you punch the throttle. And I say, yeah, I thought I could punch through this <laughs> sandbar and, like, pop out on the other side and continue going in the river. He's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to give you man points for that. Like, that's, that was – we funny. increased speed as we were going to crash. Yep. And, um, and so he'd say things like that. But he – I kind of thought, he's got the greatest job because he was a seasonal employee, which is what I was as well. So he would work over the summer and doing all the field research, which was sweet. But then in the winter time he would get kind of laid off and then they'd bring him in for different projects. And, and that was his annual cycle. And I was like, that's a dream job. But then I realized I saw him and I saw other biologists and I just wasn't smart enough or, or even gave it enough thought to realize what the progression was. But I, I started to see him and some of my um, elder peers and my bosses and those students and, and workers that were ahead of me being promoted into the office. And so now they were running studies and hiring guys like me. Right. And so then I thought, hmm. my next progression is going to be hired into the office, and then I'm going to be running studies with guys like me, seasonals. And I thought, Donnie Vincent in an office. That not, sounds awesome. Not happening. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> not happening. Yeah. And uh, and so I was like, oh man. And it wasn't as though I sidestepped, but <laughs> this is a little bit muddy for me. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. But, right. Right. Um, I ended up um, meeting some people in the hunting industry. Yep. Uh, I went on a hunt in Illinois, and I think that was kind of the first thing that came down the pike. And I went, went on a, a uh, archery hunt in Illinois, and some hunting personalities and some hunting bigwigs were at this camp where I was. And so, you know, they sit there and say, you know, what's your name? And oh, Donnie Vincent, what do you do? I'm a biologist. Oh, that's cool. And they ask me stories, and I tell them stories, and they're like, whew, that's fascinating like you right. hey hey you gotta like this is donnie you gotta hear a story and and then um and then um uh, a gentleman approached me uh from um uh he's a photographer john hafner he's a, a professional photographer wilderness wildlife photographer and um and he said he was doing a cover story project for peterson's hunting that oh, he wanted okay. to shoot for a doll a doll sheep hunt and so I was going on a doll sheep hunt, and I was working on some other projects in the hunting industry, different, different. Um, We're diff- going to come back to how you got on a doll sheep hunt, but keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is kind of an interesting story. Um, and so I. Um, Aren't they all? <laughs> I, um, and so uh, he said, hey, uh, I know you're going on the sheep hunt. I kind of want to shoot some editorial work like that. Peterson's Hunting has hired me to do this cover story. Could I come on the hunt with you? I was like, yeah, sweet. Let's do it. We kind of negotiated a deal, um, and so he came on and, and took some incredible photos. He's a really talented guy, and it was a very difficult hunt, so there's a lot of really good content. because when Half is a very good photographer. Yeah. yeah, and when you do hard things, you get good content. Or yeah. when the weather's horrible, or you, you're in an airplane crash, or your raft flips, or you get mauled by a grizzly bear. All that stuff <laughs> is interesting epic and yes yeah, it's it, different it's it, very hard to get that's yeah. why hugh glass had one right there when he got mauled by a grizzly bear yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 leonardo yeah. dicaprio had yeah. a yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> you got to get that. You got to get that on film. Yeah. And so, uh, so we went and did that project, and and kind of one thing led to another, and then Sitka approached me uh, about being a Sitka athlete and like coming on and doing some hunting shows and writing some more, and and uh, and then I was always filming my hunts with a little handy cam, mm -hmm. like just literally pointing it out myself, being like, stay three. It's frosty this morning. I saw a grizzly bear yesterday, and I would, then whenever I would see wildlife, I would just sit there and film it, you know, and I'd talk into the camera. And, yep. and then some of my buddies started using some of that stuff. Guys that I'd met, I shouldn't say buddies, guys that I'd met started using some of that footage for um, for TV shows. Right. And so then a couple of people started being like, hey, you're the guy that films on this TV show. And I'm like, why? Well, not part of the show, but they just use, use some of my content. footage to, yeah, to do yeah. some of this stuff. And so... One thing kind of led to another, and then, um, you know, like I said, I was doing more stuff with Sitka, and then I kind of contemplated doing some video work, true video work, real video work, but I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to run a camera, no idea how to do any of this stuff, but I was like, it'd be cool to do a video project and do something that, and then Sitka um, lined me up with one of their other athletes, and they said, this guy's working on a big film project, and we think that you guys would get along great. We think that you would film great. Was that Sam? Nope, that, no, was, that, was, um, that was Jeff Simpson. Okay, Simpson. Jeff Simpson, he owns, um, I don't know the name of his company now, but back then it was Fence Post Films. Okay. And real quick, not to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. are you, so at this time, are you still a biologist? Yes. And it's kind of like a side hustle yep. type thing? Okay, perfect. Yep, this is a yeah. side hustle. I'm That's still doing research. That's what I always research. wondered. Was it like that you took a leap, or was it like a gradual change? It was gradual. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was gradual, but at this point, when I started talking to Jeff, it started being serious. Like, okay, I'm going to bring money into your company. So you're seeing this now. Like You're, you're like, I'm going to take your value. Your yep. Yes, yep. because now a few people have approached me about doing my own TV show. Right. And so I thought, Oh, that that'd be a dream job because early on, I'm a huge fan. I was a huge fan. Am a huge fan of like Mark and Terry Drury of the Drury the, the Drury brothers. Like they're dear friends of mine. Huge fan of Michael Waddell um, because he would do. Uh, obviously, he did all the Monster Box stuff with Bill and and um, right. and David Bland, who mm -hmm. are both great guys. Um, and then Michael did Real Tree Road Trips. Do you guys know what that is? Oh, oh absolutely. Born and raised on it. Yeah. yeah, so like Real Tree Road Trips was like <laughs> my dream. Yeah. If if I could do anything, yes, like sir. somebody sending me to a different hunting camp every week, just right. namaste. Like, yep. He's a rock star basically at yeah, that point in the and, hunting world. Yeah, yeah he and, did that. And perfect. And um, um, hmm. I kind of have a funny story about Michael, but I met him. <laughs> I met Michael in Illinois, and um, he would tell this story. Uh, when I met him because we were in the kitchen by ourselves and I said I'm going to say this once and he's he was like making a peanut butter <laughs> sandwich or something he so here over, we go like, yeah okay I said I'm going to say this once once only but I just want you to know I think you're awesome I'm a huge fan and um, me being here in the same hunting camp of you as you is um, really remarkable it's not a time that I'm ever going to forget I said that's all I have to say I'm never going to say it again and he just started laughing, and later on that night, he told the story, like, to all everyone else. He's like, Don, you heard what Donnie said to me this morning? He's like, <laughs> Michael, I'm going to say this once. And, um, That's funny. And so, um, you know, I really want to do that stuff. And so, like, meeting Jeff, like, Simpson was wickedly talented with the camera, in my opinion. Really good composition. Um, he's a nice guy. And there's 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 a long story there that I'm not going to drag um, your viewers through, but... Um, he had kind of a checkered past, and so um, when I had heard some, you know, I kind of heard some things about him, and and uh, and so I went and checked with him, and I was like, I want to give this guy a fair shake, and mm -hmm. I went and checked with him, and I was like, hey, I heard this, 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 and he's like, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's not true, that's true, and I was like, oh, that's really cool, he's really forthright with me, and um, and so um, uh, we ended up doing some work together. Uh, our partnership didn't work. We had very different philosophies on where to go and what to do. And um, and so essentially, uh, I decided that I was going to leave and start Sigmanta. And um, at that time, um, he had two people working for him, uh, the two two gentlemen that still work for me. And I just told those guys we we're, uh, were on a trip one time in Patagonia. I just said, hey, look, uh, I've really enjoyed working with both of you. I'm leaving and starting my own company. Mm. 
if you guys have any interest. And I basically said, if you guys have any interest, and they both said, yep, we're coming with you. Yeah. I said, okay, right. great. And so I left. They came with me, and um, and you know Jeff went on to do his own work and has done a great job. And then we went on to do our own work, and and um, and so that's and then and then I I honestly had no confidence that I could do this. In fact, I sat down with people in the industry, not necessarily the who's who. If I if I mention these names, which I won't, but if I told you the names, you probably wouldn't recognize any of them. But right. I said, here's the deal. This is what I want to do. I want to come out with a film series that's not a TV show. I want to do it my way. I want to build the films my way or our way. I wasn't the only one. It was the three of us. Yep, I want to build right. the films our way, do it, and, and then um, like sell sponsorships to them. And all these guys were like, amazing. It'll never work. And I said, no. And they said, no, it'll never work. And what was the reasoning why they thought it wouldn't work? They Did said, they tell you? Yep. They said, the model is TV. And and there's kind of this hoodie wink of like, you buy the airtime, right, up front, and then hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, <laughs> right, ridiculous, yeah. and you're paying that, you're paying, and then you're trying to get sponsors on the back, yep, and then yeah. you're you're get begging re- Matthews, you're begging right. Hoyt, you're begging Lone Wolf Tree Stand, you're begging Sitka, you're begging all these companies to please pay me a hundred thousand dollars a year, two hundred thousand dollars a year, right. fifty thousand dollars a year, to twenty thousand dollars a year, cover your costs, and then see how much you can make at the end, and you still got to live on the backside of that. And pay for all your hunts. Right. And so now Ouch. now you're calling outfitters, begging for a free bear hunt. begging. And I wasn't doing this. I refused to do this, which is I, – I wasn't even ever going to entertain that model. But you're calling saying, hey, you give me a free antelope hunt. I'm going to introduce the world to right. whatever J&J so. outfitting. Right, yeah. right. You're going to get huge. I'm a big star. It's going to be amazing. Your books are going to fill up. We're both going to do great yada yada and none of that stuff comes true it it comes true for michael right right for michael has that kind of power or maybe like lee and tiffany have that kind of power but Mm -hmm. you know i didn't have that kind of power nor was i ever going to have that power i still don't have that power now in fact yeah in fact those days are done and gone now now outfitters everyone that i hunt with i pay full price Mm -hmm. and not only do i pay full price i have to pay for non-hunters because not not only are outfitters not giving hunts away anymore now they're charging you for photographers to be there because they're eating right. more. They're taking up a bed. They're if, if, if we're staying at a lodge, whatever. So yep. it was a long and bumpy road, and I didn't have an ounce of confidence that we could do this. And um, and eventually, you know, Kyle Nicolite and and um, and a few other people said, Donnie, let's just do one. Let's just do one film." And Kyle paid me a compliment. This is really nerdy to admit all this. And I, I always forget when I'm talking to you guys, I forget that cameras are on and that I'm actually saying this stuff out loud. And, and, um, we love it. And, and that your moms are probably going to watch this. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, um, she's probably going to own this on DVD. So um, <laughs> I'll give her, I'll cut it half rate though. Yeah. So you're welcome. Mom. Kyle Nicolite one time, um, and he's, he, he and I are still um, partners in Sigmanta. And, and uh, he said, you know, you're really, uh, you're really good on camera. And he doesn't pay anyone compliments for anything. Um, and I said, yeah. And he said, yeah. He said, I don't think you realize how good of a storyteller you are yep. and how naturally you come across because you see your hunt in a particular set of photos in a particular timeline and you navigate those t- photos in that timeline in a particular emotion. Yep. And you're very good at conveying what it is that you're feeling and how it's going and what you're assimilating it to in your life in a grander view. And he said, I think you do a really good job with it. And that, I mean, honestly, might be the first time somebody in my life said, just resonated. You're doing a good job at something. Right. right. You're, you're worth it. Yeah. And yeah. so I was like, wow. Okay. And, and, uh, and then we had William Altman, who is a photographer out of Maine and he's incredibly gifted. Um, He's a really tough kid, pretty fearless or fearless. Uh, everyone that we work with is, if, you, if you're not fearless with us, you fake it. And we fake it. Right. You know, we have to face our fears of cliffs and bears and whatever else. But um, he, he did a really, so he shot beautiful work. Um, Kyle edited beautiful work. And uh, to use Kyle's words, he said I was very good at s- telling my story or the story. And so the three of us kind of had this ingredients of doing something. And so... Everyone wanted to do this project, and uh, everyone was all in, and I said, hey, I'll do it. Um, I don't know what's going to come of it, but let's make at least one film. And as I've talked about this uh, multiple times in the past, 
um, I started writing the voiceovers for this film, handed them to Kyle. They're on a little yellow notepad, and he's like, this is terrible. <laughs> and I wrote it like Michael. Right. I wrote like Waddell talks. I yep. wrote like, this. well, this is something that Michael would say right here on Real Street Because you're Road thinking trips. that's what people want to see. That's what people see. want. He's, right. the, he's yeah. the most... He just ma- amazing on camera. He's an amazing shot with a bow. He's uh, the real just, deal. Just, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And he's not fake. In the, you know, like some of the stuff he does now, you know, you're like, God, did he really just say that? <laughs> and I mean that in a silly way. But he's that person. Like yeah. he's really that dude. Like he's, right. he's interesting all the time because that's, that's who he is right. for real. And that's why people watch him because that's him. He's genuine. So that's genuine. Right. Yeah. Very genuine. Yep. And you can tell that he's kind of a, a goof. Yeah, if he's calling a leopard frog a, a belly flopper, wally wally popper yeah, in, his, right. in his in his yard, it's not because the camera's on. He literally just called that that's the him, belly yeah. whopper, floppy popper, like two seconds ago, and there's no camera on. You know, right. like yep. that's just Michael, and and um and so I wrote it like Michael would say something, and Kyle's like, "This is terrible." That's not you. He's like, "I've never heard you talk like this ever." Yeah. Yep. He's like, "You always talk about how you're sad when you kill an animal, and you always talk about the animal itself, and you always talk about the kind of the biology, and how you know, truly like." sea hunting kind of as a sport but not as a sport because it's a blood sport you know i kind of that, that phrase of like you know i hate the word sport for it because football is a sport right and and so but people talk about you know being a sportsman and i don't mind that term so much and, right right and sporting arms i don't mind that term so much but so like i kind of so have he this. saw it in you as the people would be interested in your personality yeah you and you alone like yeah. you don't have to fake being other people yeah. are trying you don't have to try you just have to be you. And that's and, right. And that's exactly what he's, he send, was saying. Send yeah, you back right. to the village while we die yep. at the hot gate. <laughs> tell him you got to send the eye patch dude back <laughs> yep. and tell the story. And so he just said, he said, tell your story. Let's make this film for us, not for an audience, for us. How do you see the Rivers Divide? How do you see this hunt for Steve? Like, I'd never named a deer before, and I didn't name that deer. A friend of mine named it. So all of a sudden, things started layering up and taking shape, and William didn't know how to film a movie, and I didn't know how to write a movie or to be on camera. And Kyle's the only one that actually knew how to edit a movie because he went to film school. And mm-hmm. so, like, one of us was trained, and the other two of us were tumbling through space like an asteroid. But we put a film together, and I thought the and and um, and I use this term loosely because I. Definitely have shades 100% of... 100% loosely. 100%, 100%. <laughs> loosely. Loosely, 100%. The, that's been the theme for the last couple yeah. of days. Yeah, 100% lives within a kind of a realm of kind of in so Somewhere between 70 and 99.9. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, we, we, we did this film and we did it for us. And then we thought, if people want to watch it, I wasn't sure if, you know, Rednecks were going to watch it. I wasn't sure if, you know, like... Uh, Western hunters were going to want to watch it. I didn't. I wasn't sure if whitetail hunters were going to want to watch it. I wasn't sure if Michael's audience was going to want to watch it or the jury's audience was going to want to watch it. I wasn't sure of any of that stuff, but I was like, I want to make a film that I would want to watch. Right. And I want to make a film that is real. Like, if I miss a deer, let's show me missing the deer. If I wound a deer, let's show me wounding the deer. If I fall out of a boat in the river and I twist my ankle, let's show that. If I gut shoot a deer, like, let's show that. Like, let's... I don't want to be infallible because right. I was going through some hardships with shooting and hunting is always difficult. And when you see a buck like that, you're like, holy cow, I've, you know, like, there's a camera right. on me. I have once in a lifetime opportunity. This is the biggest deer I've ever seen. I want to show all of that stuff because I'm assuming that that's what kind of everyone experiences. Some, get, right. It's authentic. Some people don't get that. And they, when they do experience it, then they shut down. They're like, I don't want to hunt again. You know, that that happens with, I see that happening with females a lot because they get this persona like, you know, a deer steps up and they, it happens with anybody, not just females, but like they wound the animal and this is say they're their first time hunting. Yeah. Yeah, And then they don't necessarily get told that, you know what I mean? That that deer could run off and you may not. Then you may not find it. It's, yeah. it's part of it. I mean, right. the spinoff for me is like uh, when I was pursuing a career in golf, I always loved turning on the TV and watching a PGA Pro shank one. <laughs> you know? Sure. Because it happens to everybody. Because right. it happens to everyone. I mean, like, uh, hunting isn't getting. Right. You know? Hunting is going out, uh, putting your time in, and, uh, you know, that shot is a split second. It's not the hunt itself. Yeah. Right. You know? But it is a, a second time. It's what we remember. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. But uh, I think the fact that you show 
exactly. show this. It's right. so authentic. It's refreshing. I'm like, Donnie missed this buck. It's okay if I miss this buck. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't really help just, just yeah. things i happen. cried myself to things happen that, yep things you can happen. only worry about the things that you can control not the things that you can't control which you That's and right. i struggle with entirely yes like yes. flying home tomorrow i have anxiety cause, yeah. but i can't control any of it yeah. right no you can't so it's just like one of those things and you show that and you relay that to the audience and they they soak that up you know what i mean like they they, they love the true meaning behind the things and no no hidden gems there's no you know we're we're you know, some of these shows that are out there, they try, they struggle so hard to get that on film, and they they tr- they struggle so hard to not make a mistake, and they never show that. Mm-hmm. It's just like, boom, shot, shot after shot yeah, after shot, 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 kill, and, shot, yeah, kill, and shot, it's just kill. like, which they have to do that because they only have twenty two minutes to convey their story yeah. on on that, yeah, in that platform, in that platform, right? Where yeah. You have however long you want, yeah, do it I the mean, way you want to do it. Yep, the other side. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many bear hunts is that in one? Oh, I was like seven years of bear hunting. It's and, like, um, you know, it's not seven years, but it's probably like 12 or 16 weeks of bear hunting in Vancouver Island, the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak, Western Alaska. Um, you know, it's all kind of over the it's place. It's the golden corral of bear hunts. Yeah, it's it is. A, it really is. a buffet of awesomeness and yep. i think uh i mean i told you i fell in love with you from the word go on the rivers divide <laughs> i thought that hunt was i thought it was awesome i thought the story you told was amazing i loved the uh the, it was a comeback kid story you yeah know? you didn't yeah. give up i want to ask you you know uh fanboying yeah went after things went bad with steve yeah. uh, that one year yeah. when you came back and found out steve's alive steve's okay yeah you can still hunt this deer yeah. and also that the wounding of him didn't affect him, no. you know? Yeah. I mean, he was still a strong, live, oh, yeah. humongous he, deer. What oh, did yeah. he end up scoring? He was in. He was, uh, what, it was really funny because we thought he was 185, but then we realized that the deer out there are really tiny. So he's 165. He was essentially 165 when I wounded him and 165 when I killed him. He, just, he just took a different, like his G4s were um, longer the year that I um, wounded him, and then they went down, but other things grew right. yeah. the year that I killed him. Like his, his shed is right here, actually. This is so awesome. Um, Donnie's just like, hey, here's, yeah. here's a shed. Yeah, here's, here's, a sh- here's a shed from the day, the day that I wounded him. And um, I would have had a matching set. <laughs> I would have had a matching set, um, but the farmer. The look um, on Matt's face right now is pretty <laughs> priceless. <laughs> The farmer found both sheds in a hayfield, <laughs> got out of his tractor. It's not the farmer, the farm hand. Grabbed both sheds and tossed them over to the side of the field, and then on the next pass, ran the other one over oh, and mowed it into a million pieces. Oh my god! So he got this one. So that's Steve, the day that I wounded him. This is incredible. Wow! Isn't that cool? I feel like I'm Indiana Jones holding the ark. <laughs> so this went down. <laughs> And then he, you know, he split here and he like split here yeah. and, you know, he did some stuff like that. But, yep, this that's is incredible. I mean, yep. like, so when you realize Steve's okay, take me through because you are so good at explaining the emotion. Mm-hmm. How did you feel? <laughs> when I knew he was alive yeah. again. So I just thought um, I have a real chance at this deer. and I have a really chance to kind of close this chapter out. And thankfully, the guy that owns the ranch um, – his name is Bill Sinar. He's uh, uh, or Bill Siner. He's a, a great friend of mine. I've hunted his ranch for 13, 14 years, something like that. And when I wounded this deer, because he's the one that told me about it. Mm-hmm. So I knew Steve. Do you want to look at this? Because it's pretty incredible. But I want it back for the rest of the time. <laughs> I knew Steve <laughs> um, because I passed him when he was four. Okay. And at the time that I passed him when he was four, it would have been my biggest deer with a bow. But a friend of mine, Jeff Moygan, who was the uh, he was kind of running hunts on the ranch at that time? I said, "Hey, there's a pretty good sized deer. Uh, his nickname is Steve, uh, which is another story about a friend of his who thinks naming deer is really dumb." And so, so my he friend, named a deer after. Yeah, so, my, <laughs> Love so, that. so Jeff's like, "All right, the next big deer I find, his name is Steve." And so um, he said, "I'd prefer if you didn't shoot him." And so I, he said, "You can shoot him if you want, because I think he'd be your biggest buck." But you know, I'd prefer you didn't shoot him. So when I saw him. Um, I didn't shoot him. And I saw him in the exact location of which I killed him. So I killed him at seven and a half. And I passed him at four and a half in the exact same location. And so um, 
then I came back and was talking to Bill because I, I took a year off of the ranch and I was hunting in Montana or something. I couldn't make it work with my schedule and I was coming back and Bill said, Hey, are you going to come hunt this year? And I said, I am. And he said, I'm hearing word from other archers that there's a huge 10 pointer across the river and a few guys have already missed him, you know, have shot at him and missed him. But I guess he's, Bill said he's so big that he's haunting people. And, um, and so then I went in there when he was six and a half and that's when my first encounter is with him, you see, and what goes down. And, um, and when that happened, Bill said to me, no one else is hunting this ranch until you kill that deer. Like I'm shutting wow, all other bow hunts off. No one's coming here until you kill that deer. That's wow. pretty that's amazing. special. He's an yeah. amazing guy. And, um, he was really incredible, incredible about it. And, um, and so he just kind of let me have it. And, and so when I, when I saw that he was still alive, I just thought we have a real chance at this. I learned a lot about him last year and I'm going to hunt him. I'm going to be vigilant about hunting him this year, but I wanted to put, a ground blind in place because the tree stand the night that I had the event with him, the tree that I was in was just this little tiny, um, elm tree. And I remember William was in, I was 12 feet off the ground. William was, oh my gosh. yeah, William was like 10 feet off the ground. Cause he was it, in an even smaller tree look like that. Yeah. Right. It, it looks, yeah, it is. I mean, it might not, it might it, be 10. I might've been 10. Yeah. I was way low. So and he's, then, close oh yeah so i don't have a great hearing but i'm sitting there in my own tree william is right where you are and he goes hey <laughs> that's what i hear the because hey, that's kind of how my hearing works i won't hear the stuh i won't hear the eve i'll hear the hey you know and so i looked at him and i said what and i could hear the crickets chirping it's kind of a summer evening if you will and i go I just was thinking, I was trying to play, because how my hearing works, sometimes somebody will ask me a question, I just have to, like, pray it over my head, like, okay, that's what he's saying. I look at him, I go, what? He goes, Steve. I go, oh, Steve. <laughs> and I look at him, and, it, and just looking at his eyes, and he's just like, he goes like this. And I look, he's and right under down. William's tree stand, he's at, like, three yards. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. And we're 10 feet off the ground. So he... So this is like... Hearing him breathe. He's yeah. almost at our feet, right? Like, right. he's five I mean. feet below us. Oh. And uh, and I looked down, I'm like, holy cow. And he just walks out and meanders out. And and um, and it was funny because this little... We would plant this little... Basically, we would kind of, like, it's bait him. It's like a meadow almost, yep. right? So yeah. we would bait... The, how we would do this, um, their property sits up against the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. So we'd go in there early in the year and we'd dump all these oats... And then they deer would come in and basically plant a food plot for us. Mm. So in the late July, August, whenever we'd go in there and we'd coat this whole area with oats and we'd put in a uh, mineral lick. But they never really did mineral licks too much because the, the soil out there is really salty. Hmm. So they would come in and they'd eat the oats, but in eating the oats, they would plant them with their hooves. Hmm. And so then the, by the time hunting season came around, we'd have this lush little oat field that they looked come like in and it. Eat. I mean, it's high. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 some of that stuff would grow up and be too high, but let the deer would come in, and as they fed, it would get down to where. Sometimes we'd go there in October, and it'd be, it was like you. We couldn't have planted an oat field better if we had a tractor. Just right. Fresh right. Little Just shoots coming perfect. Up, yeah. And all they do, they come there, they feed through it, almost never breaking stride. They might hit the mineral lick for a second. That's what that thing that Steve was rounding. Mm -hmm. He was gonna lick that once and then be on his merry way. So right. when they would go through, they would just basically like take three bites they're walking through and they'd go to the alfalfa field on the other side of the river. And um, and so I was just, you know, it was just kind of an embodiment of what happened that night and and um, and having him right there. And so I was like, okay, if we're going to take this for real, um, we have to put a ground blind in here, a for real ground blind, which we hated because we wanted to film everything. And when right. you're in a ground blind, you're in this kind of black little hole. So yep. um, I called a friend of mine. Do you guys know the company Double Bull? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're yep. Blinds, so, yeah. Yep. So Double Bull was making those really cool hub blinds. Yep. But they toyed with making um, hay bale blinds yeah. mm -hmm. back in the day, really solid ones. So I knew a guy, a friend of mine named Billy Volkert. He had a friend of his named Mike Wiltz who filmed for Double Bull. And he had one of their prototype 
hay bale blinds. Hay bale blinds, yeah. He lent it to me, and um, and so I took it. It was all tattered and everything, and we refurbished it, built it all up, drove it all the way out there, which was miserable because I pulled it. This thing is giant. It's like pulling a sail. Yeah. I drove it 12 hours pulling it with a Toyota Tacoma. <laughs> It was horrendous. I bet it was. It was so Not stressful. Not windy at all out here. <laughs> oh, and, was, and we had like a 20 mile an hour headwind the whole yeah. way. We, we would go. I could watch my gas gauge just going down. Yeah, but anyway, so we, we get that thing into place. We buried a log in the in the ground blind. So we didn't want to have our cameras on sticks because we didn't want that sterility. Mm-hmm. We wanted to have a camera arm to be able to move and like oh. film different angles and things like that. Neat so, idea. Right. so that's what we did. And then we'd hang like different camera angles in there. And we'd even record sound in that booth. It's like you'd get, like, my breathing or, yeah. you know, like, we do some sound design of, like, when I'm eating peaches and stuff like that. And so, um, but all that stuff was, like, we built that scene to kill Steve. Mm-hmm. We were hunting that one deer in that one spot. We knew where he bedded. We knew where he fed. But he would take, he could walk anywhere he wanted to go to feed. It yep. was the it was not a bottleneck at all. It was a little thicket, and there was zillions. It was, like, rabbit trails going through this thing. <laughs> And we just sat um, however many days. It took like 45 days. And we and we would sit. <laughs> we, we would sit. Um, like even in the summertime, we'd go in there. Or not summertime, but early fall. We'd go. We ended up going to blind at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Like legal light went to, you know, like 9 or 10. And so we wouldn't even see deer until like 8. But yeah. you were in there early just to not disturb We'd sit anything. there for five, six hours. And sometimes we'd go across the river like the wind would be perfect. We go across the river, and all of a sudden the wind would be blowing Shifty, out the back yeah. of our neck. We'd get right back in the boat, go back across the river, and we went on that night. Huh, yeah, yeah, right. And then on October 26th, on October 26th, we had hunted the morning, and then we went in to eat something because we f- thought the wind was going to switch. Mm-hmm. So it was going to be no good to hunt anymore. So we went in and ate something, and then the wind didn't switch. Mm-hmm. And William was checking. We had a trail camera over there William was checking the card and he's like oh my word he's like Donnie he was there yesterday right after we left he came in or no I'm sorry we went in in the afternoon because the wind was wrong in the morning and then the wind was going to be right in the afternoon mm-hmm. right in the morning and then going to get wrong again for that next afternoon he checked the camera and he's like yesterday morning when the wind was wrong he was in he there was there I was like holy cow like because that was the you know, we saw him once in August We on trail camera, mm-hmm. and we never saw him again until October 25th. Mm. He was daylight in the morning, and then so because the wind didn't change, we decided to go right back in there, and then I'll never, ever forget that. Like, does are filtering in, and it was, <laughs> the sun was setting, and everything was backlit. And I remember I was just sitting there, and there's a cedar bush. That, that, that ranch in North Dakota, if I had the money, I would buy it. The thing is paradise huh. wow. and bill the owner bill signer he's just he knows it and like we talk about it all the time and it's just a paradise and so um i'm looking at the cedar bush and i'm looking at the lights kind of dancing through and does are coming through and other nice bucks are coming through and then i just see this buck and he's <laughs> he is facing like i'm over here and he's facing like this yep and then he turned his head and he was like itching his chin with his back foot and I could just see this massive tine and I said um I'm like William there's a buck coming down the trail and he is massive he's like is this Steve and I said I have no idea but he's for sure a shooter we're not going to shoot him because we've committed to one deer but he's for sure a shooter and then he just starts walking I'm like oh my word it's Steve and I'm like it's Steve it's Steve it's Steve it's Steve 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 and he's like okay and I came to full draw, and I had a uh, little Matthews helium, I think, at the time, mm-hmm. full metal jacket, I think, and uh, G5, the um, the mechanical. Dead meat. Yeah, but before that, it was like the old yeah, version right. or whatever. I know what you're talking about. Yep, yep, yep. Mo- yep. Not Montec. Anyway. If, if you guys it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, yeah right. Te- tech something or something like we that. We had T Bone here. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Anyway, we love that broadhead. I love that broadhead. I don't like mechanicals very much, but I love that one. And so I just came to full draw. And, yep. And I had a Scott, I think it was a Shark XT or something release. Mm-hmm. And I just wrapped my finger around and just put my pin on right behind his shoulder. And I just basically just 
You know, it's like, that, okay, that's it. And I just pulled and boom, an arrow blew. He was slightly cornering to me, slightly. And the arrow went right behind his front shoulder and blew through him. And he whirled around and ran out. And I just sat there. And I looked at William and I was like, and I do, I do this stuff to this day. I'll do this. I looked at him and I go, is he dead? He goes, oh, he's dead. <laughs> and I was like, you, you're, and I already know this, but I'm like, you're positive. He's like, 100% we got him, Donnie. Like, Loosely. we got him. Loosely yeah. 100%. <laughs> and um, it was really funny because then we wanted to just back out of there. Right. So we sneak out and we sneak out across the river. And it's funny because we go back in the house where we, where we were and the family is they're washing dishes and mm-hmm. cooking dinner and they don't realize that it's broad daylight and we're back just getting into the meat of the hunt of t- uh, you know the magic hour what time was it do you remember um we shot them at like 4 30 in the afternoon that early yeah well at, on october 26th the light you know only goes to like whatever 6 30 or something yeah, like that, right. or six so I mean, it's, it's still man for him to be up on his feet oh yeah yeah and then the backlight like the sun was setting. This is gorgeous. All the beams yep. are coming through. Right. You can see this whiskers, and you can see. Yep. I'm like, man. And so I come walking in the house, and I got my face paint on, and I'm just sitting there. And um, Bill, Bill's like, hey, Donnie. I was like, hey, Bill. And he's like, da 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 da. And like, I go, oh. And I go, uh, you're curious why I'm back? And he's like, uh, did you shoot Steve? I was like, I did. <laughs> and he's he's a little psychopath ranch owner. He's like, oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. Um, got, okay, I got, I got my rubber boots. I got my, I got my rubber boots. I got my gloves. I got my rubber boots. Got my gloves. Got my, and I go, Bill, Bill, Bill. I go, we're not going. Just calm down. He's like, <laughs> we're not. I was like, no. He's like, bad shot. And I go, great shot. He goes, we're not going. I go, no. I go, we're just gonna chill out. Yep. I said he ran through all the super tall sagebrush grass and everything, and I said I just want to slow it down. Yeah. I don't want to do this. Good for you. And then I never told this story. I don't think, <laughs> but we knew he was dead, but we knew we wanted to track him. And William gets up in the morning. This family is a very, um, very Christian family, and so, uh, but William he swears a lot. He's just, <laughs> it's just his way. He says a lot of f bombs in natural conversation, <laughs> and so. Um, he, we get up in the morning. We we didn't intend to leave him the night, but we left him for so long that we're just, you know, William and I kind of discussed and we're like, let's just leave him the night. Yeah. Let's yeah, just, right. because, and I'll be honest with you, and people will maybe uh, get grumpy at me about this, but we wanted to recover him in good light. Right. right. Exactly. So, I was just going to say that on camera because right? you just need... You need good light for, and, to tell and, a perfect and, like, and story. And yes, we like left that. his right. we left his guts in him overnight. And yes, his yeah. meat was totally fine. So yep. it was right cold below freezing exactly. or not below freezing. He was below thirty. So right. yeah, below freezing. It was cold. Um, he was fine. Like we ate all his meat. It was great. Yep. Um, in fact, I would have little parties here with people, and I'd be like, "We're having Steve Chili tonight." And so <laughs> wow, like, you know things like that. And, That's um, funny. Um, so uh, <laughs> William gets up in the morning. And he looks out of the window and he goes, Donnie. And I said, what? And it's like 4.30 in the morning because we still got up super early. He goes, it effing snowed. (laughs) And I go, you're kidding me. He goes, no. It snowed like an inch in this place. We're in western North Dakota. It is so beautiful there. Like you drive in and you drop down on the Badlands. Like it is one of the most beautiful places, if not the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. And, um. And I was just, I've been hunting this place for so long. And I, I'll show you guys some pictures when we get, when we get done with this. You'll, I think you'll get a kick out of it. But um, so we're like, okay, well, we'll just go back to the arrow one step at a time. Right, yeah. And then um, it was really funny because I had some friends that um, accused me of staging Steve where he died. Right. Because he died. Tucked up underneath that little bush. Yeah, there, he kind of right? like, and I think the weird part is that I think he kind of died at a dead run because he, I think he died right away because you can just see the blood is spraying and he just did this hook and there was a big sagebrush there and he's just kind of like tucked up and piled into it. Yeah. Right. Like I think he just skid into his bed and he died and and that was it. It's kind of neat. Like I could, I guess I see what they're saying not to defend them, but like the way he was tucked up there, his head's just kind of up too. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah. And so, um, I have some good friends that are like, 
okay, just I'm not gonna tell anyone. Just, just tell, tell me. me. <laughs> just tell me the truth. I'm like, we didn't stage anything. So, um, but there's snow there. You could tell, like, as oh yeah, there'd be in. human tracks, right. right? Like if we case closed, you okay, know, whatever. Yeah, cool. And so, um, <laughs> and so we, you know, we got them, and and um, and then you know we just filmed the whole thing, and it's just epic. Yep. Yeah, it was cool. And then we cut. My broadhead was still in the shoulder, mm-hmm. and um, and that was cool. From the year. From the year before. Before, yeah. Yep. And so it was still in his, you know, kind of the ridge of his scapula. And so it was just, wow. Just a yeah. surreal moment. Just like yeah, oh, all coming man. together. Just like, oh, my God. And I didn't even care about the deer or the antlers or whatever. It's just the story. Yeah. Like, and seeing Steve. Right. Seeing him again and just like, oh, yep. my God. Like, because this is easy, the biggest deer I'd ever seen, you know. And mm-hmm. it's like, whoa. And man. you're just like finishing the sentence and. Putting the period at the end. Yeah, that's exactly and right. Just, and then, yep. And then, like, backing in the barn. Yeah. Right. Like, that's another thing that's, like, funny when you're trying to do stuff for cinema. I'm backing in the barn. It's, like, the first five attempts. I my <laughs> Tacoma got stuck going over that little, like, the, <laughs> the little lip. Yeah. yeah. That's Thank funny. you, Toyota. The, bo- the wood is, like, this tall. My truck's, like, Boun- zzz, bouncing in and out. Zzz, and William's, like, come on. I'm, like, I'll, I'll get it. That's funny. And then, you know, finally you see it in the film. I'm, like. You know, yep. it goes over, but yeah, we attempted like three or four times. My truck just spun out, probably because my tires were bald. But that's funny. Um, man, you got problems with tires, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I probably got a flat right yeah. now. Yeah, you might have a flat. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be driving you to dinner, yeah. That's uh, funny. One, thank you for sharing that because I just like fell in love with Donnie Vincent because of that film. Yep. Um, now it, we're gonna do another podcast too where we talk more, we're gonna get more into the ethics of hunting and. You know, where you go and what your goal is in the position that you're at now. Because you're in a very unique position, you know. Um, And uh, this is, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. This is the second Steve because it happened again. It happened again. It happened again. This is a a shed from a buck that I shot again. I shot this deer and when he was six and a half and it was 30 below zero when I shot him. And he's 30, like 32 yards. Same place. Um, is same ranch, different place. I was hunting on a place called the Oxbow and I shot him and the arrow went, I thought I smashed him. I thought I hard shot him, but it went through his brisket. It just was like an inch low and that deer ran off. He's a big eight Here, pointer. Hold it up next to this. So. <laughs> and, um, and then I ended up hunting him for three more falls, just that deer. And I, I ended up, I wounded him at six and a half Gave him a, you know, I grazed his, his, uh, his brisket. He was totally fine. Like I saw him. I saw him probably 10 minutes after I shot him and he was dogging a doe all over the place. He was just fine. But he, um, and then I killed him, uh, three falls later at nine and a half. Oh my goodness. Nine, nine and a half. Nine so minutes. the story is just from the Badlands. It's just oh, like, that place for you, is, it's like, I got a special place. I haven't hunted that place in, in two years. And I was just talking to Bill the other day and he's like, when are you coming home? And I said, <laughs> at, 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 and I said, really soon. I'm coming home really soon. Yeah. So Your next off year, I'll be home. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a story. Well, one I mean, last thing to finish, and we'll finish up this podcast, and I'm excited to get into more of the, uh, I guess, because you're just so passionate now as, like, uh, a steward of hunting. Um, you really become uh, a, a voice for hunting, but telling a story and being able to put it in such an eloquent way to bridge the gap between non-hunters and hunters, and I love that about you. And I think it's such a big burden, and I appreciate you taking it on. Um, it's really cool, but one of the other things I appreciate about you is, uh, and you mentioned it earlier, you become, you're sad about, ta- it's taking a life, right? Yeah, it's heavy. Hunting's taking a life. Felt it yesterday. Was excited to harvest a gobbler. Mm-hmm. Harvested a gobbler with Jared, good buddy of mine. Donnie freaking Vincent. Like, <laughs> incredible, right? Lots of emotion there. Looked out there, saw some feathers flying. Right here. That, yep. But I think that's also how I know I'm still human. That's what yeah. separates, like, a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> when when you got a hold of Steve, obvious elation, because you're kind of probably scared because of the snow, right? Yep. Yeah, nervous, yeah. But you get a hold of him, feeling of, like, that pursuit's over now. Yep. Um, incredible animal. Mm-hmm. And you made a very big decision very big responsibility to take that animal's life Mm -hmm. can you take me through that yeah and i considered as weird as this is the sound and we talked william and i talked about it 
we consider just passing him, letting him walk right on through and just saying, we could have got him. We could have got him. We had our chance at him before. We're letting this go on it. We're just going to let his life play out. And ultimately we decided, William's like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I feel like I want to take him, but I know it's going to be heavy when it happens. Just in the moment. Yeah, and you're the executioner, right? Like, let's say you're Tom today. You're Tom yesterday. They put on this grand show. They don't know that it's a trap. Right. They know that they are the king of this meadow on this morning. Like, your Tom was the king on that morning. Your Tom has been the king for a while there. Yeah. And he came in to stomp. Like, he, he saw an intruder. Yep. His emotions and his biological response to be the only Tom breeding hens there overwhelmed him. He ran in and came Attack. to kill. Right. He came to kill your Tom, not to scare him away. He came to kill him. Right. And, um, but you pull the trigger and hit lights out. And, and it's just, it, you can't help but think about, um, he no longer exists as a turkey. Right. right? That it, it was a light switch event today. He didn't because suffer. Of- the trigger pull that you don't even remember. That's right. Right. But still because of his hand. Because of your hand. If you decided not to shoot, that turkey's not getting shot today. Right. And he continues to exist. And it's kind Hell, of... I was there. And... <laughs> yeah, well, for a moment, he was... <laughs> no, um, okay. And so you, you kind of feel this. And then today was the last day of turkey season. Right. So if you don't kill him today... He's moving he, on. He moves on for another year if he could even make it another year. Like, he's an old bird. Um and they only, you know, turkey's lifespan is not, yeah, you know, it's five, probably six years. Yeah, a tops, you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. tippity tops. And so, um, and depending probably if he takes the life of another turkey too by doing what he did today, mm-hmm. because that was obviously his intentions, mm-hmm. because yeah. that's on camera. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, by my hand, he, he's no longer here. He's no longer. It's the cycle but, of life. It happens. There are predators and there are prey. And we engage. It's important to us as people. We've lost our way as a as a right. as a species. Right. We've lost our way of of who we were, where we've come from, what we're doing. You know, for God's sakes, now we're discussing really <laughs> messed up stuff. Yeah, really unbelievable right. topics. I mean, the fact that we are discussing gender <laughs> in a human being, or in right. and, and and the interesting thing is, in Mother Nature, there are really some. Um, very you know there's really crazy designs if you will in mother nature there's a lot of animals that have a lot of you know whether that be um having uh uh, you know having uh luminescent bacteria Mm -hmm. that lives near one's eyeball that almost has like a a headlight if you will that's swimming in very dark water to brain heaters on some sharks to uh just a a myriad of adaptations that take us through the animal kingdom that that make animals thrive and exist and, and survive through differential reproductive success which is Really, we're all here just to procreate, right? So um, there are a lot of strange things, but really as a people, all we've accomplished thus far, in my opinion, is that we are dying slower. Nobody's living or very few people are actually living their lives. Most people are just working towards retirement or most people are are just working towards get to the weekend. Mm -hmm. Most people are just working towards their next drink or their next piece of cake or their next long uh, weekend long weekend whatever it is I you're kind of like, chasing that's this perfect right yeah and yeah. so so we've we've we want to elongate our lives and we're confusing that with living them and then right. when somebody gets killed you know if i die in an airplane crash this fall you know people say oh my maybe some people would say this is a tragedy uh donnie vincent lost his life at 48 in an airplane crash in a lot on the alaska peninsula But really, that'd be a far, far cry from the truth. The truth is I was living my life as full as I knew how or could afford. I'm not a billionaire. I'm living my life as full as I knew how and doing things that I wanted to chase and things that I wanted to see and experience. Right. And and sometimes that comes with shortening your ride. But really, the people have just absolutely no idea who they were. And if you wanted to figure this out, I've talked about this a few times, but if we could snap our fingers right now, shut all the electricity off. In the world, there's no more electricity. When you turn the faucet on, water doesn't come out. Right. When you go to the grocery store, the food is rotten. Mm-hmm. You do those three things, Whew. and we are hunters and gatherers tomorrow. Yep. Your hair color doesn't matter. Your skin color doesn't matter. Your talents 
your um, tenacity, your physical nature. That's all that matters. You are either designed to be a warrior, yep. you either know how to use a weapon, know how to use a tool, and are here to contribute to the, t- to the tribe, or we leave you out in the cold, or worse, we feed Pe- on you or leave you behind. People would lose it. Like, a very, very large percent of people today would have no idea what to do. And, and all of the things that shape us, all the things that say, well, I believe this. Yeah. Well, yeah. I believe this. And mm-hmm. I believe this. All that stuff would melt away. Because right. now we'd be discussing, are you warm and dry? Yep. Do you have water to drink? Mm-hmm. And are there more calories going in than coming out? Right. Right. Because those three things are the only things you have to worry about up until the time that it's time to have sex. Yep. Those four things embody all of life survival if that water stops coming out of the faucet there's no electricity and the food at the grocery store rots yep and i can't think of a better time to end this segment because i I can't wait to talk about this you're so passionate about (laughs) it when he starts bringing up we are warriors i'm like let's do this i love it (laughs) Yep, Uh, yep i mean uh so we'll 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 end this podcast i mean it's uh your, your, your journey's been incredible. Thanks for making the Rivers Divide. It made me so happy. Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> in, in the next one, we're going to get uh, st- the, the whole thing with Steve. I now name my animals. Uh, I've told you about the hunt for Cornelius. He was, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to throw this out there. 27 and 0. Because I didn't post at all to the story <laughs> because it was such a, I'm hoping it's a comeback story just like the Rivers Divide because Cornelius Cornelius, forty-eight pound turkey back home. He went. So I have a dry erase board at home on the side of my refrigerator, and it has Cornelius, and it has twenty-one tallies next to him. It has Matt, and there's a goose egg there. And underneath of it, I wrote because I thought it was inspirational, like this inspirational. You you want to experience fantastic things, go to fantastic places. I'm like, well, Matt only needs to win once. Well, guess what? I didn't win, (laughs) but. Hopefully we have a very soft winner and Cornelius makes it because I'm pretty sure he's he's at least 19 or 20 now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and he's still cooking. But my new friend Donnie Vincent just gave me a great tool. Yep. His name is Whitey. Mm-hmm. We don't mean that in a racist way. He has a white head. He has a, His name's Whitey because his head is white. Exactly. And uh, Dave Smith decoys. you got to check him out. Um, as we end this podcast, we're going to do another one. you got to check out part two because we're really going to get into the uh, nuts and bolts of uh, hunter versus gatherer. My uh, my college roommate was like, Steely, you're a hunter and I'm a gatherer. And I'm like, yeah, you're dang right. You know where to run whenever the lights get shut out. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And he knows yeah. it too. That's um, funny. You know, we're but uh, we'll say this eight million more times. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I know you don't do this with a, a, a everyone that doesn't fall light on us we understand that we appreciate it and thank you so much absolutely thanks for this opportunity thanks for the hunt uh no way we can thank you actually i'll just continue to say it um and uh something that you absolutely hate because i know you're bad at it but how can people find and uh come visit donnie vincent yeah you're right i don't like uh, (laughs) instagram and i don't like facebook and uh so it's my name donnie vincent D-O-N-N-I-E underscore Vincent, V-I-N-C-E-N-T for Instagram, DonnieVincent.com. And um, we sell our DVDs. We sell some downloads. And we, uh, you know, are selling some merchandise, not like These hats. sweet hats. And, look yeah. at that. Highly yeah, recommended. I'll, I'll get you guys set up with some hats Town before Town. we leave If you here. even go on YouTube and look up Donnie Vincent and yeah. check out his short films on there and some of the intros, you will be amazed. Yeah. And you, that'll lead you to the to the full CD. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yep. And that's I mean, it's amazing. I I mean, uh, again, just thank you for all this. I don't know if you and I are still going to be friends after I steal your lot of sweater and uh, Steve shed here, <laughs> but just shed. just know that I'm still uh, one of your biggest fans. So I'm only going to tell you this one time. <laughs> I think you're awesome. No, I've already told you this fifty five times. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I appreciate it, and and I really do appreciate your guys' uh, service as police officers. As I said, told you guys. Well. Uh, Kyle Olson, my friend who's a narcotics officer in Oregon, um, he tells me stories all the time and just the stuff that you guys see and do. And and we've really confused this as a society. We've confused officers with being against us. And you're there to quite literally 
do the opposite. You're there to protect us. You're there to assist us. When people call, you come running. It doesn't matter if there's gunfire. It doesn't matter if there's um, a, a horrible car accident or a fire. And, and police officers just do. It's really a thankless job. And uh, people somehow have confused um, um, following the law and being a good steward to each other and being a good citizen with That's being on too. the boring side of life. And yeah. they want to be on the non-boring side of life in which it, it, it forces them to engage with you gentlemen and and i just i have a lot of friends who are police officers and i just think it's an amazing career and i think what you guys do is far and above beyond what people really comprehend we and, thank and, you and yeah, appreciate we thank you thank you yep. we thank you well uh that's going to do it for this episode of the blue line bow hunters podcast uh check out the next one which i think uh we're going to film in like 15 seconds now <laughs> we're going to take a break um uh, but uh, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, boys. Thanks, guys. Check out the Blue Line Bow Hunters on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or their website, www.bluelinebowhunters.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time, watch your six.